Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Now in today's episode, it's about time for some more thrift stores and garage sale finds, don't you guys think? Yeah, so I was able to make my way over to some thrift stores and some garage sales recently, actually within the past month, and I came across four things that I thought would be pretty interesting to do a video on. We're going to jump right into it and get started with this really interesting Wii disc right here. This, my friends, is a Netflix instant streaming disc for or the Nintendo Wii. There's a very interesting story behind this one, and I actually thought of doing a dedicated video on this disc, but then when I was starting to do some research on it, I came across a great video from the YouTuber, Stop Skeletons From Fighting, which really details everything very well, and I'll have that video up in the cards and down below in the description if you want to go and check it out. But to give you the gist of what happened with this disc here, to tell you why this thing even exists in the first place, this is the result of an exclusive partnership that Netflix has had with Microsoft to offer Netflix instant streaming exclusively on the Xbox 360. And it worked pretty well, except for the fact that Microsoft, being the company that they are, required you to have Xbox Live Gold to be able to watch Netflix on your Xbox. And all you have to be a Netflix subscriber, you had to be an Xbox Live Gold subscriber as well. Isn't that so nice? Thanks, Microsoft. You guys are really great. But anyways, Netflix did not want to limit themselves to only Xbox 360 users, they wanted users of Wii's and PS3's to be able to watch Netflix content as well, and that's where this DVD comes in. This is a clever loophole that allowed Netflix to get around their contract, their exclusivity agreement with Microsoft. If you were a Netflix subscriber, you could request one of these discs, they were free, have Netflix mail it to you, and then whenever you wanted to watch Netflix on your Wii or PS3 or even PS2 in some regions, you would insert this disc to your console, launch the Netflix client stored on the disk, and be able to watch content. So technically, it was not instant streaming, even though it says instant streaming disk for Wii right here. It was not instantaneous streaming because you had to have this disk, you had to put it into your console, you could not launch it directly from your console's menu. That was only on the Xbox. But because of the way the agreement with Microsoft was worded, it did not outright prevent Netflix from offering their services on other consoles, and this disk was the very clever mechanism in which they were able to do that. And yeah, I found this at a thrift store for like 25 cents or 50 cents, something ridiculously cheap. And I didn't even know what it was. I was really intrigued because I saw Netflix and Wii and I was like, wait a second. I didn't even know Netflix offered this because I mean, I knew they offered the Wii channel and that only came around in October of 2010 when Netflix's exclusivity agreement with Microsoft expired. But this is how you would watch Netflix on your Wii or PS3 before then. And so this is what the packaging looks like and the disc itself itself actually looks pretty similar to a Wii game disc. So you've got the Wii logo here on the left, the Nintendo seal on the right, and right here at the bottom it says, use every time to watch instantly, do not return disc to Netflix. And this was to let you know that this was not a mail order DVD that you could get from Netflix, which Netflix, by the way, still offers a DVD by mail service, if you didn't know that, very interesting fact. And for those wondering, no, the disc doesn't work anymore. I mean, you can put it into your Wii and launch it from the disc channel, which, by the way, has the same little jingle as the Netflix Wii channel. But you'll immediately get this error message, letting you know that Nintendo Wi-Fi connection is either experiencing high traffic volumes or is just down. Yes, this disc relies on Nintendo WFC, and since it was permanently shut down back in 2014, as I'm sure we all know, you're not going to be able to get past this screen. Unless, of course, you have a homebrewed Wii. You can use Wii MMFI Patcher to patch the disc to use Wii MMFI's replacement servers instead of Nintendo WFC, and this does get you past that error message only to display a completely different error message, which tells you flat out that this disc is no longer supported, download Netflix from the Wii Shop channel, which 
Well, we can't do that either because the Wii Shop channel was shut down back in 2019 and Netflix went along with it. Though I was surprised to find out that there are still a couple of channels that you can download from the Wii Shop channel, the Wii U Update channel and the Legend of Zelda Skywalker Sword Save Data Update channel. So yeah, I found that rather interesting, but streaming on the Nintendo Wii, it's actually still possible. I've seen a couple videos of people showing you how you can do it using some third-party tools, and that is something we may dive into in a future video, but for now, let's move on to our second item of the day, this copy of Daytona USA for the Sega Saturn. Now, I don't own a Sega Saturn, but if I ever happen to get one, now I have a game that I can play on it. So this right here is a not for resale copy, which I found particularly interesting. It could be that this was bundled with a Sega Saturn when it was purchased. There's no barcode or anything on the back, and it is in smaller packaging, kind of like how Wii Sports is when it was bundled with the Nintendo Wii. Uh, the packaging for that does not contain any barcodes or anything like that, and it is smaller than a traditional Nintendo Wii game case. The the disc itself appears to be in pretty good shape, so here's the front of it here. As for the back, it's certainly seen better days, but I don't really see any major scratches that would prevent the disc from loading properly. So that's Daytona USA, and yes, unfortunately, the packaging is a bit damaged up here. You have some tearing in the outer casing here, but the back looks fine. It's rated K through A right there, that classic ESRB rating that is not used anymore. And yeah, a pretty neat find. I think this was like 25 or 50 cents, so I just bought it because, well, why not? All right, so now we get into some computer peripherals. This right here is a Logitech MX Revolution, the world's most advanced mouse. That's a pretty bold claim. I wonder how they came to that. I wonder if that was a survey done internally by Logitech employees. Who knows, but that's what they claimed it was. This is an older model in the MX line. Some of you may be familiar with the MX Master. This is essentially an older version of that mouse, and it was released sometime in 2006 or 2007. I was able to find a CNET review from January 2007, so I suspect that it was released a little while before that. And the neat thing about this is I believe this has never been opened before. So there's this piece of tape right here, which looks to be something from the factory. There you Go. I plan on keeping this sealed for now. There is the possibility of me opening it up in a future video, but I had always kind of wanted one of these MX mice, and now I have one. This was like 25 bucks at a thrift store, and I just bought it on that basis. So there you go. That's the Logitech MX Revolution. All right, so the last item we have to take a look at today is actually a couple of items, and they're all contained in this box right here. This is a box for the Philips Savvy DB dual band GSM phone released in Germany. Now this phone was available in other regions, but this specific model, the specific variant of it was released in Germany, as you can tell from the German on the package here. If we open it up and we take a look inside, we have the phone itself, so here it is. And it looks like a pretty standard phone from this time. Nothing too fancy or special. It'll get the job done, it'll make calls, it'll receive calls, all the things you need a phone to do. So we'll set that aside here. We have the manual for the phone, which is also in German, and we have this international guarantee from Philips as well. Now, I found this at a garage sale a few years ago, actually, and just never got around to making a video on it. And when I was going through some stuff in storage recently, I found this and I was like, oh, I should make a video on this. And that's exactly what we're gonna be doing because not only is the phone in here, there are some other interesting items in here that we're gonna get to. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to power on the phone because the battery is dead and I don't have the charger to it. Now, I know some of you are going, well, what the heck is this right here? Isn't this the charger? This is actually a Motorola charger. Now, the Motorola, oh, it's actually broken there. I didn't even realize that the cable, yep, that's ripped. But there you go. So this is the charger for a Motorola phone, which is obviously not this phone right here. This is, again, a Philips phone. Now, I suspect that this right here is the phone that this charger went to. This right here is the manual for the Motorola TimePort tri-band mobile telephone. And judging from the word Danish on the back here, I assume that this was purchased through a Danish carrier, which is rather interesting. But unfortunately, I don't have this Motorola phone itself, and we're just gonna set that aside for now. 
The really interesting thing, and what we're going to be spending the rest of this video talking about, is what is contained inside of these envelopes here. Before we get to that, though, let's talk briefly about this. So this right here once contained a SIM card for this Danish carrier. Today, they are known as Telenor Denmark, a company that was created by the merging of this company and another company. And the company itself is actually a subsidiary of the Norwegian carrier Telenor. So I just found that kind of interesting. So we'll set that aside here. And now we'll get into the main main topic of what's inside this box here, which is, of course, some foreign currency. Now, I myself have always been into collecting foreign currency, and right here we have currency from three different countries. We have some Danish money, we have some Belgium money, and we have some British money. Even though this envelope says Danish coins and bills, there are British pounds and pence contained in here, and we're going to start with this, and we'll touch on these two later. So, we only have coins, we don't have any bills, unfortunately, but here we go. And we'll just separate these out by denomination. So we've got two pounds right here, so we'll set those here. We have one 50 pence coin, we have one two pence coin, we have two pennies, we have two 20 pence coins, we have a 10 pence coin, and right here we have a five pence coin. All in all, this is worth currently about four US dollars, which I'm certainly not going to exchange this for four US dollars. I would rather keep the currency because like I said, I find this stuff rather fascinating, but there you go. I have never been to the United Kingdom. I would love to go though, but I haven't had the opportunity to yet. And well, if I ever go, I happen to have some currency I guess I could use in the country, but no, I would just, you know, exchange US currency when I get there or before I leave in the airport. But anyways, there you go. Now, before we move on to these two envelopes here, I want to point out the name of this hotel on these two envelopes here. So these two envelopes came out of a hotel in Germany. And this envelope right here, fittingly, it has Danish money inside, came out of a hotel in Copenhagen, Denmark. So what I found interesting about this box right here, which contained all of this stuff, right, is that it was actually owned by somebody who traveled very frequently to Europe. This person worked for a major US corporation's European division, and she lived in the US, and that required her to travel to Europe very frequently. And I assume this was the phone that she used when she was over there. Now, I know this because of some correspondence, some letters and whatnot contained in this box that I'm not going to show you because just for privacy reasons, they contain personal information like names and addresses and all of that. So yeah, I just found that rather interesting. It's cool to know the story behind all of these items here and you know why somebody had currency from three different countries, actually four different countries inside of this box. I mean, obviously this was brought back to the US, so these were probably brought back as souvenirs, but still it's just rather interesting to know the story behind this phone and all these items here. So we'll set the box aside and we're going to save the Belgium currency for last and I'll touch on why in a minute. If you know anything about Belgium currency, you probably know why. So we're going to set that aside and we're going to move on to the Danish currency right here. So we're going to open this up and not only do we have coins, but we have a couple of bills as well. And we have a lot of coins actually. And there you go. Now let's take a look at the bills. So we've got three 50 kroner notes. So here's what they look like. Here's the obverse and here's the reverse. And we have one 100 kroner notes right here. Now these are series 1972A notes, or at least this one is here. These are just 1972, so they are rather old. And doing a brief currency conversion, all of this currency right here is worth about 40 US dollars. Yeah, definitely a much larger payout than the British currency here. Now, if I remember correctly, I believe I paid about five or ten dollars for everything in this box here. So looks like I've already made my money back, which is pretty awesome. Now, I'm not going to convert this to US currency. I would much rather keep the Danish currency. And of course, this is just going by face value here. There's always the potential of 
One of these notes being particularly valuable, maybe this 1972 50 kroner note happens to be, and it's worth more than 50 kroner, maybe 51 kroner. Wow, wouldn't that be exciting? But no, I just find this stuff really cool, and I'm going to keep the foreign currency for sure. Now we're going to get into the most interesting part of this package, and that is the Belgium currency that we have right here. Now what makes this interesting is this currency is no longer in circulation. That's because Belgium switched to using the euro in in 2002. Prior to that, they used the Belgian franc, which is what we have in here. So this currency, like I said, is no longer in circulation. Now, this person ended up with this currency because this phone right here was manufactured in 1999. So that's around the time this person was traveling through Europe, maybe in the year 2000, 2001, but it was before 2002 when Belgium officially switched to using the Euro. So that explains why she ended up with Belgian francs here. So we're gonna go ahead and just do the same thing we did with the Danish currency and separate all of these by type. So we've got all of our Belgian coins laid out here, except for this one, we'll come back to it later. I know some of you are gonna comment about that. And right here, we've got the Belgian banknotes. So we have a 200 franc note, here's what it looks like. We have two 100 franc notes, so here's what they look like. And we have two 2000 franc notes. Very cool for sure, I've never seen this currency in person before, and it's rather neat that I own some of it now. So we'll set this aside and we'll take a look at this mysterious coin that I set aside a little bit earlier. So this right here did not come from Belgium. This came out of Germany. This is a 10 Fenning coin that was produced in the year 1988, two years before German reunification, which was in 1990. This came out of West Germany. This is a West German coin. And again, it explains why this person ended up with it because Germany was not using the euro like they do now at this time. So this coin was a bit old at that time. I mean, assuming this person was traveling throughout Germany and the rest of Europe in 2000 or 1999, this coin was already at least 10 years old at that point, which is rather interesting. So uh, yeah, there's your 10 Fenning coin that came out of West Germany. So yeah, that's all I've got for you guys today. A very interesting turn that this video took for sure. I'm sure a lot of you guys weren't expecting this at all, but hopefully you enjoyed this video nonetheless. And if you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up and get subscribed down below. Turn on those notifications if you haven't already to get notified whenever I upload a new video, which I do multiple times every single week on this channel. And as always, I want to thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.